Welcome to Goonies World. My name is Goonie, also known as Colin. And I'm here today, as always, with Johnny Farrow, also known as Sean. Hey there, everybody. And Meanie, also known as Ryan. Hello. And our returning guest star, Lunicorn, also known as Lynn. Hello. Good evening. Yeah, so we're playing a game called Maze Rats. And once again, Johnny Pharaoh will be GMing. Yeah, I've just been on a roll of GMing. I think after this one, I might step aside for a while and let some other people run games. I know you guys have some cool stuff in the works, but for the next several weeks, we'll play Maze Rats. It's a game by Ben Milton, and you can get it at Drive Through RPG for five bucks, and I think it's worth every penny. Uh, ben is the creator of Nave, which is my favorite D and D like game, and it's one we played on the podcast before. Maze Rats is based on a game called Into the Odd by Chris McDowell, which is also incredible in my opinion, and it's one I hope to play on or off the podcast at some point. Maze Rats and Into the Odd are considered part of the so-called Old School Renaissance, or OSR, that is, clones of older editions of D&D. You know, everyone and their brother, including myself, has their favorite little tweak on the traditional rule systems. I'm not sure why Maze Rats is considered part of the OSR, because aside from some terminology, Maze Rats is nothing like D&D in terms of game mechanics. The feel is there, but it's an entirely different system, both in rules and philosophy, and I think the only reason it's lumped into the OSR is that a lot of OSR people like it. It's a rules light system. It's a very slim 12 pages, and 10 of those pages are random inspirational tables. Maze Rats abandons the traditional 20-sided dice for a, uh, a 2d6 plus something mechanic that is far closer to classic Traveler than it is D&D. There are no demi-humans like elves or dwarves or halflings. The whole concept's just completely ignored, just like in Nave, and frankly, I don't miss it. There are no classes per se, but characters can choose a quote-unquote feature that effectively cast them as a fighter, thief, or magic user. But you're not locked into that forever. When you level up, you can choose different options. So if you're familiar with D&D-derived games, you'll find this to be a very simplified, stripped-down version without clutter, and in my opinion, it's better. And you know, it's funny, because we've actually never played D&D on the podcast of all the games that are out there. We've talked about it a few times. And there's like a million other podcasts that do, so it's not like we have to. You're absolutely right. The closest we've ever come to D&D is Nave, and then in our 100th episode special, we did the Black Hack. But since this game is suitable for it, in this one, we will explore all of those classic D&D tropes. You know, meet at a tavern, travel to the wilderness, explore a dungeon, and who knows, we may even meet a dragon. And it was tempting to set this game in our worlds that we've played in before, the Dearth of the Red Sun setting, or Gonan's World, or one of our other favorite homemade fantasy worlds. But for Maze, for Maze Rats, I've just created a whole brand new setting uh, using the inspirational tables included with this game. But I've been talking a long time, and before we get into a whole bunch of exposition, let's see what kind of characters our friends have created. Ryan, can you tell us a bit about Puck? Yeah, all right. Um, he's uh, a bit of a you know a rough-looking fella. Um, now he's got technically um, red hair and a uh, red beard, but he's shaved off his beard and mustache, and uh, you know he's made up a uh, a peculiar uh, sort of concoction. Um, of like ashes and and boiled walnuts and bits of earthworms and used it to dye his hair black. Um, uh, normally he's we, he's on the run, uh, so to speak, from the sort of the law, and um, uh, because he's kind of a thievely fellow. Unfortunately for him, he's got a very sort of telltale. Um, physical detail uh, 
which is that I've only got nine fingers. Um, so, uh, yeah, but um, he's probably like, I don't know, like five, six, and stocky. Okay. All right. Great. Colin, can you tell us about Rufus Hambone? Yeah, Rufus Hambone. If he would probably be the, um, if we had classes, he would be the fighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I will just read like, you know, when you do the character creation, you can pick, you know, your appearance, physical detail, or you can do it randomly. I just picked mine because I had a character in mind. So um, his appearance is bull-necked. Physical detail will be mutton chops. Uh, he has a background in bounty hunting. He wears bloodstone, blood-stained clothing. His personality is stubborn, mannerism breathy, and yeah, he's kind of a big, stocky guy. Looks like he's built like a refrigerator, and. Um, yeah, I think that is him. Okay. And finally, Lynn, can you tell us about the mesmerizing Madame Miriam Mordant? Okay, Madame Miriam Mordant, the Magnificent, um, is I did hers completely randomly and then based the character off of my results. So I kind of did the opposite of what Colin did. Um, so I'll go through the same. Um, her appearance is gorgeous. Uh, physical details. She's got tattoos. I'm figuring she's kind of a illustrated woman. I, she's got a lot of tattoos. Now, a lot of them are cl- covered up by her clothing, but she does have, uh, shorter sleeves. So you can at least see the, the ones she's got on her arms. Her background is in fortune telling. Uh, Her clothing is ostentatious, which is always fun. Um, Personality is cautious, which is a little weird for such an ostentatious character. But um, and then her mannerism is she's hypnotic. So I'm picturing uh, the magnificent Madame Miriam Mordant as uh, wearing like a, a. purple, very bright, intense purple, kind of a baggy jumpsuit uh, or pantsuit type thing that tapers off at the leg. And then she's got like bright orange high heeled boots and uh, an embroidered firefly on her back, um, on the back of her shirt. Um, that's quite colorful and a little veil, not like a wedding veil, but like, I'm thinking like, I dream of genie, like that style of clothing, completely different coloring, but that kind of style of clothing. And she's got the little, you know, the little piece of lace that goes over the bottom of her face, but it is, um, see-through. So it doesn't like cover her face like a mask, but she does wear a little, little veil over the, the bottom. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think those are great characters, and I can't wait to see them in action. But before we get to that action, I'll just say a few quick words about the setting. Uh, This part I made up, it just popped into my head. Imagine a world shaped like a 20-sided die. In fact, if you go to GooniesWorld.com and look at the splash image that Colin has created there, you can see a world that's basically like what I mean. And this world's floating in a luminous ether that contains other worlds. Each one of those worlds is in the shape of one of the platonic solids, which just so happen to be the same shapes as the funny dice that geeks like us are used to. And you can see them, you know, in the in the sky. Uh, No one can travel to them, obviously, but you can tell there are landforms on them and water and green and blue. And people wonder if other folk might live on those other worlds. And all of them circle a brass-colored sun in the center of the universe. The universe itself is just this immense sphere covered with pinpoints of light. Those stars aren't other suns. They're literally pinpoints of light at the boundary of the universe. 
And beyond that, our 20-sided icosahedron world has flora and fauna and cultures that are not unlike those of medieval Europe and our own world. So it's a traditional Eurocentric fantasy world that I think most of our listeners can easily imagine. And uh, for simplicity, we'll assume you guys are, are already a little bit acquainted with one another and have decided to pool your resources and seek fortune and glory. And you've come from various small villages, but you have all grouped together here in a village called Varna on your travels where there's a tavern called the Silver Boot. And we are opening with the obligatory tavern scene. You know, we have this old joke that Ryan's games all begin in taverns and my my games all begin on roads. So I decided to flip it and begin it in a tavern this time. And uh, yeah, it's your classic tavern with a lot of wood timbers and you've already ordered a drink or two. It's spent the last of your your coins, really. You, You can crash here tonight and and uh you've already got your meal and a few drinks and a fellow comes up to your table he's got a huge handlebar mustache with magnificent twirls and he says so friends traveling through varna hey eh? where, where are y'all headed wherever there's treasure to be found ah uh, treasure treasure yeah you look the type i thought you might be well if you're looking for treasure, there's only one place. You got to go to Illyria. Illyria is one of the one, it's one of the biggest cities I could ever think of. I went there long, long ago. You know, it's right on the border of the Wilderland. That's a region of the world that's not well explored, friends, and it no doubt contains all sorts of unknown peoples, creatures, and ruins and treasures. Of course, it's a long way there, and uh, I just know it's to the south. I'm not sure exactly how to get there, but. You follow that road right out of Arna that goes to the south. I imagine you'll get that way one way or the other. Now there, you might find some directional signs, and that was say, friend. He says, looking at uh, Puck, you just look vaguely familiar to me. I can't quite, I can't quite place you. Have I seen you somewhere before, friend? Have we ever met in our, have we ever crossed paths before? Um, well, not likely. Um. But you say uh, you've been to uh, you've been to Illyria, then? Yes, I have. Beautiful city, beautiful. Uh, well, I've spent some time there myself. Uh, but um, you know, and uh, you know, looking over at uh, Rufus and and, and, and Miriam, um, it's not it's not that great, really. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to go there if I was you. Hmm. There's no treasure to be found there. Well, there is, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, it's it's a silly place. <laughs> it is a silly place. Well, well I, I got t- no time for silliness, then. Well, I tell you, if you're looking for treasure, that's by far your best bet. Of course, you can bypass Illyria itself. It's the Wilderlands, where the, where the real treasure is. All the ruins, all the so-called oh. dungeons. That'd be my bet. Hey, you there, pretty girl. You're you're quite gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Tell you, you, you you've got to. You look like you might know a thing or two about magic. Is that true? I do. I do a bit. Can you make potions? Hmm. Well, I've actually never tried the brewing of potions. Oh, really? Really? Well, well, that's too bad. I'm looking for someone who can help me out with a love spell, a love potion. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't, inter- oh. I didn't introduce to myself. My, my my name's Miles Morehouse. You see that? You see that beautiful ginger there behind the bar? And there's like your classic St. Pauli girl style barmaid. You know, that's Siri over there. And Siri, oh, I tell you, I'm, I'm just in love with her, but she won't give me the time of day unless I shave my mustache, which I won't do. I won't do. I'm not gonna do it. It's my vow. But listen, I don't suppose any of you could uh, convince her to. Take a little walk with me out to the wishing well after work. You, you, you're you, obviously people of the world. She might listen to you. Would any of you be willing to go over there and try to set me up with her? I might be able to have a word with the lady. Well, you know, before, uh, before resorting to all that, uh, I could say, uh, or should say, you know, if you've, uh, if you've never thought about Shaving off that uh, 
that moustache of yours. Um, you know, it, it, it's quite liberating, really, I, I, I've, I've found. Um, used to have a big old beard myself. Uh, hmm. Called it my pride and joy, but recently, uh, you know, I had to... Uh, well, I thought I'd get rid of it. Um, you know, it just uh, got, got a bit bothersome. Um, and I find it rather uh, freeing. To say the truth. Well, hmm, okay, well, I'll think about it. I suppose Siri would be worth any price, but I've had this mustache since I was 12. I went through puberty early, you see. But, uh, well, well, uh, madam, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe, maybe you could go over there and talk to Siri and see if you couldn't convince her to take a little walk with me down to the wishing well later. What would you say? Tell you what, I'll buy you all a round of drinks if you'll give it a try. I should be happy to, but I would urge you to consider my my friend Puck's advice. If this is clearly, if this is the only thing this lady objects to, then and you love her the way that you say that you do, then perhaps a simple shaving and a mustache will suffice. I will still go talk to her. I am merely making a suggestion. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll enjoy a drink with your friends while you, you go speak to her. And uh, so, I'll uh, assume that you walk across the crowded tavern room to Siri, who's standing behind the bar, and she says, O-M-P. She's saying, oh, my polyhedrons. Everybody worships, the, you know, the polyhedrons in the sky. They think of our gods. She goes, O-M-P. I love your veil. Oh, well, thank you. Well, so, so what can I get you? Well. <sighs> This gentleman over here is um, quite taken with you. Mm. And uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are about him. Perhaps you would like me to tell you your fortune and tell you if maybe perhaps he could be part of your future. Well, you certainly look like a fortune teller, but until he shaves that mustache, you know, I kissed him once. We had a picnic in the graveyard. And, uh, you see, he said that was very life-affirming, to uh, celebrate life in the, in the presence of death. And we kissed, and his mustache tickled so badly that I just don't think I could do it again. But he's refusing to shave it. I see. But hmm. perhaps you tell me my fortune. What is it? Here's my palm. Is that how you do it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Very well. Here's my palm. I'm afraid I have dishpan hands from all of this bar mating, but oh yes, it is pretty you look palm like a hard worker. Yes, a little palm olive. A little palm olive. I should have made that her name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, what do you think from my dishpan hands? What's your? What does my future say? Mm. Well, let me see. Oh yes. Yes, I what see. What is it? Will I meet a prince? Mm. Will I get rich? Mm. You are destined for great love. Oh, oh, really? Yes, yes. Well, I hope it's Mordecai Palmyra who lives in the tower outside of town. He's the most handsome man mm. around. He is. Mm. You fancy him more than you fancy the fellow with the mustache? Well, I love Miles. To, I mean, like a brother. Like a hot brother. But... I, I, I just feel that that mustache is too much for me. Why? Is he in my future? I, very possibly. Very possibly. Mm-hmm. I see the shadow of a man that looks very much like him. It's hard to see. You see, when I look at the future, when I see these things, there's a bit of a mist there. So I cannot always see exact details. I can only see the shapes of things to come. Mm, mm. Well, I don't know. I just have to really give it some thought. Now, here's a time when we can explore the game mechanics a little bit. So, you guys have three stats. You have strength, dexterity, and will. It's really boiled down, you know, from the six that we find in a typical D&D game. And I'd like you to make a will roll. You're going to roll 2d6, and you got to be a 10. For almost everything except combat, you want to be a 10. Okay. Now, I believe that um, 
I do roll that with advantage. Well... And I don't know why I think that. I don't know why you think that either, but I was going to give you advantage because you come up with the whole fortune-telling story, which she completely believes. I don't believe it, but she believes it. (laughs) So you you can roll 3d6. I don't know where. When you have advantage, you roll 3d6, and you can pick the two highest and add them together and hope that you get 10 or higher. 10 plus. And that plus two goes to the total. What's that? Correct. What's that? The plus, the plus yes, two goes yes, to the total. Yes, yes, your will bonus goes on. Oh, add, you add your will bonus. That's right. All right, so I got exactly ten with the bonus. I rolled wow. eight, a three, and a five. You know, plus two gives me ten. I guess that mustache is sort of dashing. Maybe I should... I mean, after all, if you think you see him in my future... Well, fine. You can go tell him that I'll go for a walk with him. He's always trying to get me to walk by the wishing well. I know what he's going to yes, do. That's... He's going to wish that we'll be together very ostentatiously, and he'll throw the he'll throw the coin into the wishing well, and then. But I suppose, I suppose, if it's in my fortune, you can tell him that I'll be happy to take a little walk with him to the wishing well after my shift is over. Excellent. He'll be so pleased. Very well. Now, while that's happening. A uh, fellow walks up to the table, a different fellow. Looks like he's got more of a military bent. Looks like he's been traveling, too. He's got a travel-stained cloak. He comes up to the table, and he says, You, sir, he says to Rufus, I can't help but notice you've got some manacles there. That is correct. Hmm. Are, you, are you a manhunter? I was. You but were. I seek greater fortune now. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'm a bit of a manhunter myself. I don't suppose you've, uh, on your travels, I don't suppose you've ever seen this fellow, have you? And he pulls a piece of paper out of his pocket and unfolds it. It's a wanted poster. It's wanted for grand larceny in Illyria. And it's a picture of a guy with a red, red hair and a red beard. Looks kind of familiar. Can't quite place him. And, uh, uh, Puck, are you traveling under your real name? This is a little late for me to be asking that. Or have you already um, introduced... Do you have a real name that's not Puck? Is that just how you've introduced yourself to them? Yes. Yeah, I think that would probably be best. Yeah, this is like... Uh, whatever your real name is. We'll, we'll call it... Uh, hey, you know what? That's a great chance to uh, use our... Yeah, your real name is... Uh, Balthazar Nethercoat. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you, Ben Milton, for your random names. But you've never seen this fellow anywhere, eh? Hmm, let me look at that. Huh, funny looking. He is a funny looking guy, isn't he? He's a freak. Yeah, <laughs> Well, he does oh. look kind of familiar. Yeah, he kind of does, doesn't he? Hmm. Yes, I've been putting... Did you say his name was? I was like, Balthazar Nethercoat. I've been putting these posters up on the road between here and Illyria. Beautiful city. I didn't want to leave, but, uh... That's where all the action is, as they say. The only city worth the name is right before where the land falls. And when he says the land falls, what he's referring to is a phenomenon you're all used to. Because the world is shaped like a 20-sided dice. Every now and then there's just a huge place where it looks like the land is falling off and you're about to go downhill. But once you step over, it seems normal, right? Because the gravity is pulling you straight down. And that's where the wilderlands are. Well, hmm, hmm. And uh, why don't you, Rufus, make uh, an, an, a will roll, another will roll. And I'm going to give you advantage on this, too, because you're obviously sitting right next to, and I've been, you know, known for at least a while, Puck. Although this, okay. this picture is, you know, art is not advanced to a huge high level. This, this is very, like, medieval-y picture. You know, they drew people back then. They didn't look super photorealistic yeah and he's uh, dyed his hair apparently and shaved his beard but yeah. I am looking right at him so uh, we'll see and uh, I so I pick the two highest ones yeah and then add your will bonus okay with will it'll be 11 now you don't have to say anything out loud to this guy, right? But oh, oh, oh. 
No, I ain't never seen this guy in my life. If well, there's a bounty for him, uh, well, I'm I'm sure I can help you with that. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. That's a hundred gold crowns there, so maybe somebody will give me some good information. Ooh. Yeah, that's a lot. It is a lot. It is a lot. It almost makes me want to get back into the business and go find this fellow and turn his ass in. Well, almost. well. I suppose. Oh wait, that that gorgeous girl you're traveling with is coming back here. I'm much too shy. I, I have to step away. I have to step away. Oh, hey, enjoy another round on me. So that, that's two rounds you guys have been bought now. Thanks for taking a look, anyway. Yeah, thanks for the round. Yeah, and uh, you could tell Pock just from the look, the way that Rufus looked over at you. So you, you. kind of know that he knows. I don't know if you want to address I'm that open. Tell him right now, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I knew you were a thief, but not a wanted thief. Oh, you're oh, lucky. Oh, did, didn't I tell you? Oh, well, uh, we've only known each other a short time. I probably haven't uh, had much of an opportunity to talk about my cousin Balthazar. Cousin? My ass? That's you right there, I can tell. Oh, that's you. You better hope uh, we find some treasure that's worth more than this bounty or else I'm turning your ass in. Well, you'd be turning in the wrong man. That's uh, that's my cousin, you see. Um, and um, well, look, I don't look anything like that. I haven't got, uh, I haven't got a beard. I haven't got uh, red hair. You know, um, the nine fingers thing—that's a total coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Oh, I'm real sure about that. Well, it could be a genetic thing, you know, in the family, like the nine-fingered people. <laughs> it runs in the family. Uh, okay, well, about now, uh, the Miriam comes back to the table, and Miles stands up and goes, What did she say? What did she say? She was smiling. What did she say? Well, she has reluctantly agreed to go on a walk with you tonight. Yes. I would again urge you, her complaint is that your mustache tickles. Mm. When you kiss her, hmm. you see, and it's very important, you know, if you want to know if someone loves you deeply, it's in the kiss. It's always in the kiss. Hmm. So I think that if you are really going to, she has, a, like I said, she's agreed to a walk with you this evening. But however, if you're really looking to pursue this woman, in the long term, I would suggest you rid yourself of that mustache because she does have eyes for another. Oh, 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 I bet it's that pretty boy son of a bitch who lives in the tower outside of town. Mm. Be a shame if that could be. be a shame if he took a tumble down those long tower stairs. No, no, I would never do such a thing. Well, no, I'm, hey. I'm, I'm, what's that, sir? I've got a compromise for you. Oh? Now you, you, Dip your hand into some lard or grease or oil. You know, lather up your your mustache so it's nice and soft and um, not so harsh on when you, when you kiss those delicate lips of that lady. You know what? That's the best idea I've ever heard. In fact, I'm going to run down to the shop right now and pick up a little tin of Fancy Sam's mustache wax and put well, that on immediately. Immediately. Can't go wrong with that, Bran. No, you can't. I'll do it. Thank yeah. you all. You're so good. such good friends to me. Thank you. Now, you spent all your money, but at least you've got a place to stay tonight, and you've eaten, and you've gotten a few free drinks. And there's a lot of things that can happen in a tavern, but this isn't a huge town, Barna, and uh, we're going to assume the rest of the night passes without incident. And the next morning, you get an early start. Now, while Puck has by no means agreed to travel to Illyria itself it is there on the border of the Wilderland which every instinct you have tells you is the place to find treasures and ruins and ancient secrets but after that early start amid the uh, sound of the morning birds it's a cool fine day with a light breeze and you travel together on a dirt road it's deeply rutted with wagon tracks and it's running next to a bubbling brook 
in this little winding valley set into low hill country. There's towering oak and elm and birch trees that are lining the path to your right, while the ground to your left slopes down to the brook. And beyond that, the ground rises again, and there are more trees and hills. But up ahead, you guys see, a, when you've been traveling for a few hours, you see a stone monument. It's not huge. It's about man high, but it's just covered with moss. And there's some writing on it, but it's kind of obscured by the moss. Uh, does anyone want to scrape away the moss to try to see if they can read what's on the monument? It's right up against the road, almost like a mile marker, you know? Yeah. You scrape do it that? off. Okay. You want to scrape that off? Okay. Well, go ahead and you start scraping it off, but when you touch the moss, this foot-long centipede that had been hidden in the moss completely surprises you. And quick as lightning, it just tries to scamper up onto your arm with this little mouth pincers, obviously just aching to take a bite of your flesh. So, please, make, make a dexterity danger roll to pull your arm out of the way in time. No advantage this time. Just roll a 2d6 and add your dexterity bonus, if any. And as usual, you need a 10 or higher. Yeah, he's not very dexterous, so no bonus, but... Uh... Let's see. Uh, I got a 10. 10. Exactly. Hey, that's exactly what you needed. And it, it misses and it crawls up over the top of the monument and disappears behind it before you can smash it. But when you uh, wipe the wor- the moss out of the way, the words on the monument say, in a very archaic version of the common tongue, that Illyria is three days travel hence. It also mentions that in a few leagues you should find a wayside shrine that could provide some shelter. These shrines are put up occasionally along the road as a place for travelers, sort of like a medieval rest stop. Um, so you've got a little bit of an idea to lay the land and a little bit of an idea about how long your trip will be. Of course, Puck has made this trip in reverse, so it's not like you guys are completely lost. But you travel on until late afternoon certainly been more than a few leagues but you do find that up on the hill to your right there's an area where some of the trees have been cleared away and there's a low dome atop a circle of squat pillars it's all covered with vegetation Um, and as you get closer you think you can hear like the bleeding of a strange animal or something there's a wagon that's in front of the shrine but there's no horse or ox to pull it When you get closer, the cry begins to be more and more clear, and you realize it's not the bleeding of a strange animal, but it's a crying baby. And the sound of the crying baby is coming from inside the shrine. What do you guys want to do? Wow. Does that... Well, I don't think think it's our problem, really. Um, Probably just, um, you know... Babies cry all the time, right? I mean, that's what they do. They cry, they and they and they shit everywhere. Yeah, I totally agree. We got no time for babies. Well, it's in the middle of the wilderness. Yeah, well, yeah. maybe the mom. Don't you is... think it's rather strange? I no, not at all. Just babies are left alone all the time. The moms and the dads go off and, you know, they, sometimes the babies are just left. Um, I don't think that's true. (laughs) Well, I don't know much about babies, but I don't like them. Clearly. (laughs) Well, what do you think, Morden? Your, your, Your male friends don't seem all that moved by the cries of the baby, but it does seem like it's in distress. Well, I will go check it out. If they do not wish to accompany me, then I shall I'll look at it. check it out by myself. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go with you and see what it looks like. Well, perhaps... See if it really is in distress. Perhaps someone is missing it and we could get a great reward for it. You never know. Yeah, well, yeah. when you put it that way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, maybe... Okay, all right. Well, you guys creep up closer to the shrine. It's definitely coming from inside the shrine. Beneath that dome within the circle of pillars, there's a square stone chamber with a wooden door. 
And that door is closed, but it does seem like old and rotten. And um, do you want to take any precautions at the door? You know, you could do things like, you know, this is uh, in the all the D and D tropes. Check for traps. Listen at doors first. Anything like that you uh, you want to do? Absolutely not. <laughs> How about a, just open it up like you know, no nothing's wrong here. Okay. Well, when you reach out to touch it, try to open it, you realize it's actually it doesn't move. It's you realize it's actually wedged shut from the inside. There's no lock on it. This is meant to be a place where anyone can come and stay. But uh some somebody's wedged it shut from the inside or blocked it somehow. You'd actually have to push or kick it open uh by making a strength roll. Is that something you would like to try to do? Yeah, strength. That's okay. what I'm good at. Okay. Well, go ahead and make a strength roll. You need 10 or higher. Roll 2d6 and add your strength bonus. Hope for a 10. No. Oh. Well, make you, it. you bang against the door really hard. Uh, but it doesn't quite it. it doesn't quite open. There's there's no rules against trying again. Do you want to give it another shot? A little help, baby. Can you come and open it from the inside, baby? <laughs> well, you're you're yelling a lot outside the door. The baby's just crying harder at this point. And and that's all no. you can hear from coming in there, you know, the baby cries. Try it again. All right, why don't you give it another shot? I know I can do this. I'm strong enough. I'm damn strong enough. All right, that time I got two sixes. Oh, that's nice. Because you, uh... And by the way, if you're ever in combat and you roll double sixes, that will be considered a critical and you can get double Mm -hmm. damage. But you smash the door open. And it's totally dark inside, or it was, because now... You know, the afternoon light's creeping in. And you can see, leaping up, quite surprised, three terrible Grimlocks feasting on the raw flesh of a horse. It must be the horse that was once attached to that wagon. Now, Grimlocks are are human-like monsters. They're troglodytes who live underground, and they hate the light. Like you've heard, they'll actually, like, burn up in the light. They actually have no eyes at all, but their noses are so sensitive that they can essentially see, like Daredevil. Uh, even still, uh, they flinch at the light when the light comes streaming in, and they're surprised. And uh, <coughs> they stop their gory meal, and they're screaming with rage at the interruption. They're naked, and they carry clubs made of auroch bones. And in the back corner beyond beyond them... It looks like a dead man, and nestled up next to the man who looks dead is the crying baby. Now, it's obviously time for a fight, so let's explore the Maze Rats combat system. Now, you surprised them by just smashing in the door, um, and you guys automatically gain initiative on this first round. You're also going to get advantage on all your attack rolls for this first round. That is, roll 3d6, pick the two highest. There is no set, you know, uh, pattern for who goes in what order. But I think we'll assume, since Rufus was the first one in the door, that, that he will go first. And like I say, the Grimlocks are surprised. They're scrambling to get their clubs. Uh, but... I'm going to go ahead and let you charge in and attack. I believe you have a two-handed weapon, but you can't use your shield while you're car- you know, while you're using that two-handed weapon. So we're assume yep. the shield is slung on your back, right? So uh, to attack, what you need to do is uh, roll 2d6 and add your attack bonus, which is plus zero for everyone but Rufus, who has a plus one. And you don't need a 10. What you need is their armor. And they're completely unarmored. So you need a 6 to attack them. Again, there's three of them, coincidentally. And there's three of you. But Rufus, you've surprised them. You've leaped in. All this, it took me a while to explain that. But all this has happened in, you know, like one or two seconds. And I'll assume you go charging in. Yeah, we got Grimlocks in here. Time to die, creatures. 
Uh, I rolled a... With the plus one, I rolled a seven. Okay, so you've done one point of damage to the first oh, Grimlocks. Plus another one for my longsword. Oh, that's right. You have that two-handed weapon. So you've done two points of damage. Now, the damage is just the difference between... You know, like, anything over what you need is counted as damage. There's no separate damage roll. And it's a pretty nasty slice. And... You know, creatures in this game don't necessarily have a ton of health or hit points. You know, you guys know that you don't. And, uh... But you just give him a big old slice, and he howls out with rage. And then, uh... Who's next in the door between Puck and Miriam? What do you guys think? Well, I think Puck would probably... Um rush in when he saw that there was a fight happening. Okay, what do you do when you rush in? Well, so we had talked uh, about sort of the way the... Well, I don't know if it really meant... No, he's just going to st- stabby stab with his dagger. He's not even thinking about the poison. Yeah, you do have some these. poison, which we've figured out a way for that to work, but uh might want to save it. You've only got three doses of it. So you stabby stab with the knife... You've got your shield because you're using a one-handed weapon. Yep. For now, anyway. Ooh, that's going to be... And then the plus zero for the bonus, right? Right. And you're taking a different one? Yes. Okay. And uh, uh, with three three dice, drop the lowest. That's going to be a ten. Ten is... You're going to do four points of damage to him, which kills him outright. Kills him outright. Uh, yeah, you just bury the dagger right between his non-eyes, you know. You can tell he used to have eyes. They're, like, evolved away like a cavefish, you know. Um, he doesn't even have time to scream. Your dagger just thunk. It just, just like, stabbing a watermelon. There's a very satisfying thunk. And he, he dies instantly. And then, Miriam, what do you do? You're third into the room on this first round. Hey, one round, you've already put one down and injured another. What does Miriam do? Okay, Miriam will use her sling um, on the one that has not been injured okay, yet. Okay, a point of order here. So I can stay at a distance. A point of order, according to the rules, if you have any ranged weapon, you can't use your shield. But I am the game master, and I think a sling, you swing around with one hand, you know what I mean? So anyone who's using a sling as a ranged weapon, I will still allow them to have their shield. Excellent. I need to pick one of those up. Nine. Nine. Thunk! The sling uh, sling stone just smashes into the head of the third one, doing three points of damage to him. He staggers backwards. Now it's the next round. Now it's the first normal round, okay? You guys actually had the surprise round before, so we didn't roll initiative, but we're going to roll initiative now. Much like Knave, uh, where each side is going to roll a d6, and we do that every single round, right? So it is possible that a turn could go at two consecutive times, right, if they lost it first and then won it the second time. So uh, I will let you guys figure out who wants to roll that that dice, I've, uh, that's a dock die. I just rolled and I got a three, so you got a good chance of winning the initiative here. I'll give it a shot. Alright, give it a shot. Uh, you need a four or higher to win the initiative. Oh. One. One. Oh, no, well, they have the initiative, and, of course, the one is, is dead. He's on the ground. Uh, one is, they're both, the other ones are, you know, fairly heavily injured. But that, that you get the feeling these are not the brightest brutes in the world. And they're enjoying eating this horse right now, but it's probably only a matter of time before they eat the man and the baby. But uh, you guys lose the initiative. And one of the Grimlocks picks up that big Oroch club. And it is also a, a heavy weapon, you know, with the plus one. And uh, the one that you hit earlier, Rufus... He uh, swings that big club at you. And what is your armor again, Rufus? It is seven without the shield. All right, seven without the shield. And Oh, my goodness, Rufus. He gets an eight. He does one point of damage. No, I'm sorry. He gets nine, which does two points of damage to you, which is a lot at first level. 
That's a, he just brains you, you know. There's like a boom. You see stars. <laughs> that one hurts. That one hurts. And then the one who uh, now Miriam was at range, right? So he he doesn't run up and attack her. He yes. turns around to the closest person there, which is uh, the beardless Puck, and he and Puck. What's yours? Is yours eight? Is your armor eight? It is. It is. Hold on. Uh, yes, eight. Okay. Well, he just rolls an eight, which does not exceed. So it might connect, you know, but it doesn't do any damage to you, right? It, you know, I knocked the wind out of you a little bit or hurt, but no, no significant damage. And that's their turn. And so now, since you guys lost the initiative, you will go, and I think we'll flip it this time, and we'll start with Miriam. All right, I'm going to take another shot with my sling. Yeah, and I'm going to rule house rule here. I mean, if you roll double ones on this, you're going to hit one of your friends because it's pretty tight in there. Six. Okay, six. Well, that's what you needed to hit him, but it's not enough to hurt him, right? So, again, it hits him, but it doesn't really do any damage. It might smart or sting a little bit, put a little welt on him, but does not kill him. And... Uh, Puck, what do you do? You've just been, of course, hit with this club from the one that's close to you. He just got he just got hit with a with a sling stone, but it didn't seem to affect him too much. Yeah, well, I, I know that goes. Um, I, I'm just gonna try to stab another one. Um, are both of the no? Only one of the ones standing has been injured. No, they're well, both injured. They're both injured, and, and they're both injured fairly badly. The one. The one that uh, just hit you was already hit pretty bad with the sling stone. Well, it doesn't doesn't much matter because uh, Puck rolls double ones. So. Double ones. All right. Well, since you're not using a ranged weapon, though, you don't accidentally hit a friend. You're not firing into a melee. But it's a whiff, a house of whiffs. And finally, Rufus. Now, this guy, you hit him pretty hard. Uh, the one that you had just sliced with your two-handed sword. I assume you will do that again. He's howling and leaping around. They're like classic monkey man, you know, leaping around, beating their chest, trying to intimidate you. So was this the guy that just hurt me? Uh, Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, you're going to pay for that one, buddy. Here I go. God damn it. Um, You don't look happy. No, I got a. It would be six, so I hit him, but didn't do it. Yeah, you hit him with the flat of the blade. You know, smacked him. Uh, maybe left a little welt, but no, no serious, serious damage. And now it is the next round, so we're gonna roll initiative again. If you get lucky, win the initiative. You can go again immediately. Looks like I see Ryan reaching for a die. I hey, come on! I got a two for initiative here. You guys got to do better than that. <laughs> I got a one. You got a one. Oh no! Well, they're screaming. You know, the one that. Uh, was attacked that attacked you last time, Puck. Uh, he gives a guttural grunt, which you just can't help but feel is a smart ass triumphant laugh. And uh, he actually gets a seven, so that's not going to be enough to actually, you know, do any damage to you. And then Rufus, the one that uh, attacked you before, got a six again, not quite enough. And so the other one, of course, is laying there dead. Also, I should point out. Just all kinds of entrails from this horse all over the floor, you know. Uh, no one's slipped in it yet, but if you get too fancy, you're starting to worry about that. Uh, so we're going to flip that order right back around. Rufus, you're going to go first this time, and what do you do? Oh. <sighs> it's tempting to use my medicine uh, that I have on my belt, but... Yeah, if it's on your belt, you're gonna take it and use it instantly. But it's just one point and, like, if I get hit, I'll probably die anyways. Two, because I have two, and I'd have three, but... He's just gonna risk it, and he's gonna... He's gonna go for the... <clears throat> for this Grimlock again. Alright. You're gonna die no matter what! Okay, and that time I got a seven. Okay, that does one more point of damage to him. Now, he's staggering. He's staggering but at this point. then I get to add that oh, plus one. Let's so not forget a plus two. one. In that case, you take his head right off. Just 
thunk. It rolls across Off with the, your head. Rolls across the floor and lands near the baby who giggles for a second and then goes back to crying. <laughs> and uh Puck, there's one left. There's one left, and he looks like he wants to make a break for the door, but then he hesitates. So it must be true what you've heard that they'll burn up in the sunlight. Well, let's see what Puck can do, and Puck can do a nine. A nine that that puts him down. Yeah, that just uh, your your dagger sweeps out, and takes him in the throat, and uh, he crumples to the ground. And now. You've defeated the Grimlocks. Congratulations. That was a challenge. Nasty yeah. little bastards. Yeah, nasty, nasty little bastards. Nasty little bastards. So, uh, now what do you want to do? Let's have a look at this baby. Yeah, well, I don't know what to do with a baby. Uh, perhaps we should, uh, um, we'll take it back to, um, the inn. Yeah, or, or there's probably somebody there who knows what to do with a baby. We found a daikini baby. Yeah, yeah. Lord Downen, take take her to the daikini crossroads. Yeah. Anyway, uh, who wants to pick up the baby? I don't. I'll probably break it. I kind I'll of pick up the baby. Okay. Let me see that. Well, I don't. All right. Be gentle. I don't like babies, but something about this baby. Oh, the look at the little, the little cheeks. Oh. Well, the second you pick up the baby, you know, it, it stops crying and it just sort of whimpers for a minute and then nuzzles its head and it keeps making like sucking noises with its mouth. You think it's really, really hungry, you know, this little baby. It's, it's a pretty sure that, uh, this is a baby girl. And does anyone want to look at the the dead guy here? See if he has anything interesting on him? Yeah. That, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I dropped the baby and no. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, look at what I found. <laughs> Weapons. No. Uh, <laughs> well, I will. Uh, he's just uh, kind of fascinated by the baby. Yeah. Yeah. I can <clears throat> imagine. You know, babies have certain spell they can cast. Well, when you uh, look at the man and you, you roll him over, you see he's actually still alive, but he's dying. He's got zero health, so no medicine can save him. Uh, it's just way past what I'm calling the golden round. Now, one more house rule I'm adding to this game, and the rules as written, you die immediately when you get to zero or less health. But in this game, if somebody can get to you within one round, you know, with some medicine, we'll we'll let you choke it down and 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 let. But you've just got that one round. This guy's way past that. Um, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> with my dying breath, I thank you. Oh, I see before me the perfect shapes of the gods. They they call my spirit home. I thank you. I I am Ellis Relish. I'm a tinker of the village of Caria. You hold my precious daughter, Poppy. Poppy Relish. Oh, Poppy. Yeah. Poppy oh, Relish. Poor mother died during childbirth, and I was taking Poppy to Illyria to live with her uncle and auntie, Clovis and Margot Midnighter. They're clockmakers. They're quite well off. Please, I beg you, strangers, if you are good enough to rescue my baby, take poppy to them in Illyria and they will reward you well they will reward you well and the great polyhedral gods will bless you now let me kiss my daughter one last time but tragically he dies before he can kiss his daughter oh, one last I'll time. kiss her for you now there was no loot in here on him he's got nothing on him and the Grimlocks were, like, naked, and they just had their bone clubs. Um, however, you haven't really looked through the Tinker's Wagon yet, which was outside. There's still a few hours of, of daylight left. Would you like to carry a little poppy relish outside and look through the Tinker's Wagon? Yeah, but I'm going to uh, hand, the <clears throat> hand the baby uh, to uh, Miriam because I have to carry this two-handed sword so I can't really be 
carrying the both, so... Yeah, yeah. Reluctantly, he'll okay. hand it over. And I'll it's, keep him safe. Yeah, now, yeah, you gotta, you gotta hold the head now. Yes, yes, I, I need, I know how to hold the baby. Okay, okay well, uh, yeah, well, oh, just a little, uh, flim- She's very cute. Flimsy She's thing. Quite cute. Mind her, yes. mind her little fontanelle. Uh, raising her as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, in the Tinker's Wagon, you guys do find a full milk bladder for the baby. It, it should be enough to get to Illyria. It just looks like it's got several days worth of, of milk in it. And there's also a few changing rags. But you also find a tobacco pipe and a small pouch of carrion tobacco. Mine. Claim it. Okay. There's also a spare trousers and shirt. Mine. Mine. <laughs> You also, because he's a tinker, perhaps you find a metal file. Yep, and taking a, that, and a hand drill, a little hand could, drill. Could cut him, come in handy. Find All a mine. Jar of grease. Yep, for my beard. Find a I don't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> In case I want to grow a beard, <laughs> you find it, and it, it it looks like grease that's for metal work. You know what I mean? Like to, but but um, and and you find a fish hook and line, and then finally like a little sewing kit, like needle and thread to patch patch things, and that that's all the loot that you find. Now, if anyone is wounded, now is a good time to take your medicine. And you got you guys. I think each have three doses of medicine, and one dose will return. One point of health. Now, if you get a meal and a full night's rest, that'll restore another point of health. And if you were to ever just do nothing for 24 hours entirely but rest, that would restore you fully to health. So, how wounded are you? I've taken two damage, so I'm down half. Okay, do you want to take... Both the two doses of your medicine? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to take one. I'll take it from the backpack so I can leave the one on my belt. Okay. Uh, so I'm up to three, and I'm hoping I can get a meal and rest to get that other one restored. So I'm okay. we'll be at full health then, but well, for now I'll, I'll take one. All right, and I believe you guys also have three rations each. Uh, which is a meal. And yeah. there's, like I said, there's a little bit of daylight left. Uh, this would be a good place, but in, under normal circumstances. But it's probably best to move on and try to find a campsite further away from this wayside shrine because it's very likely that all the blood and the corpses in there will draw large scavengers after dark. Um, so unless you tell me otherwise, I'm going to assume you're going to keep on moving down the, the rutted road. And it, it follows the brook as it bends to the south. And the brook begins to flow downhill, creating some rapids, and the road follows them. But eventually, as uh, it's getting twilighty, there's uh, a meadow with no trees just at that bend of the road, and it's covered with yellow and blue flowers. And as darkness falls, the fireflies come out. And this meadow seems to be a, a ready-made resting place, almost as if... The polyhedral gods put it here for you. Would you like to make camp here? Looks like a pretty good place to me. Okay. Yes, it does. All right. Well, as you make camp, the stars at the edge of the universe come on like little heavenly mirrors of the fireflies in the field. And you can see the light of the tetrahedron. It's a pyramid-shaped world just floating lazily up over the horizon. And then later, after you're enjoying your meal of rations, the cube and the dodecahedron come out and begin floating to the sky. And these are not like far away like our planets, where they just look like bright stars. These are close enough that their shapes are clearly evident. Um, and the baby is full from the bladder. Baby's not fussy, sleeps very soundly. And uh, now, before I say for sure that you eat those rations, you, you did find a fish hook and line, and there's a brook nearby. Do you want to try to go fishing and save your rations, perhaps? 
Let's try it. Okay. Yeah. Why not? There's a chance to save rations. We might as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you'd like to, I think probably Puck might be the best person to try to go fishing because it's a matter of dexterity. Would you like yeah. to try to get enough fish to feed your friends? Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll lend you this um, fishing hook. Yeah, all right. That uh, works. All right. So, yeah, let's have a dexterity roll. And uh, this brook is uh, uh, full of fish. I happen to know that, so you may have advantage on this roll. You need a 10, as usual. 3d6, pick the two highest, and add your dexterity bonus. Uh, well, my roll was an 8, and my dexterity bonus is a 2. That's going to be exactly 10. Okay. In that case, you do... Get some nice fish. You get some largemouth bass, and after you, you know, gut it and clean it, you all enjoy a fine fish meal. Not bad at all. Mm. And I'll assume you set some sort of watch for the night. Uh, and once you do that, you can drift off to sleep and get that that full night's sleep. And unfortunately, you know, time flies when you're having fun, and this is about as long as our episode lasts. So this is where our first session ends. But let's talk about rewards before we go much further. Now, according to this game, you get one experience point or XP just for showing up, okay? And then you should get two XP for overcoming a difficult challenge, which I think you did. I don't know how difficult it was, but it could have gone badly. You know, with the way these dice work and the damage, you could easily get cut down, you know, in one... You know, that's... I mean, Ryan killed a Grimlock just right out of the gate with a dagger. Um, so that gives you three XP, though, and you need two XP to get to second level. Therefore, you level up, and you might as well do that right now so our listeners can hear how leveling up works in this system. So you get plus two health. Boom. So you only have okay. four, and now you've got six. And you can add one point to any of your three ability bonuses. So, yep. Yep. I'm going with dexterity. I'm okay. That. Okay. Now, at third level, you'll be able to pick a, a different path. Like some of you might be able to pick up a spell or get that plus one bonus. You're not really locked into a class. But. You're second level characters now, so your health has increased, and one of your ability bonuses has increased, so make note of that. And if you level up again, like I say, you could do some other cool stuff, but we'll we'll deal with that when it's time. And we'll end as you drift off to sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you'll get that uh, other health back that you're missing because you had a meal and a full night's sleep, so you might want to go ahead and make note of that so that we'll remember and be all fresh for our continuing journey in this world with no name. And we hope you enjoyed listening. I hope you guys enjoyed playing. I like the characters. So we'll continue on for as long as it takes to tell a good story. We do have some great stuff coming down the pipe, though. Goonie is going to be running a game again. He's only done that once on our podcast so far, but he'll be doing one. I know Ryan's got some cool ideas, too, but we'll do this for a while. And we hope that you will join us again next week for further adventures on Goonies World. Hey, everybody. If you like our podcast, don't forget to leave us a good rating and or review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Spotify, or wherever you're able. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Goonies underscore world. And check out our website at GooniesWorldPodcast.com. Email us at gooniesworldpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.